Yes, Lord God, we long to see the name of Jesus Christ lifted high in every area of our lives. And so we ask now that by your Spirit you would be with us as we come to your word, that you might put it to work in our hearts and in our lives, that we might be those who bring glory to Jesus Christ. In his name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, please do uh, take a seat and keep your Bibles open at uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 2. I wonder what you would make of this if you found it on the beach. It's big and solid. It feels a bit waxy, and you can't tell this from the photo, but apparently it stinks. I reckon most of us would leave it well alone. It's not particularly attractive. But when fisherman Jumrus Chiachot came across this lump on the sand in southern Thailand, he was intrigued. He decided uh, that he should keep it, and he took it home with him. Unsure what to do with it, he, uh, he put it in his shed and then forgot all about it. Well, it's been a couple of weeks now since uh, we've heard a sermon on 1 Corinthians, and it's possible that you've forgotten about it. Not least, because what we've heard from this letter so far is that the message of Christianity is, if we're honest, not that attractive. At the end of the last chapter, the Apostle Paul told us that the central event of Christianity, the cross of Jesus Christ, is a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness. To Gentiles, a stumbling block and foolishness. And it gets worse in today's passage because in the opening verses of chapter 2, we learn that not only was the message unattractive, but so was the messenger, the one who brought Christianity to the city of Corinth. Look again with me from verse 1. The Apostle Paul says, And so it was with me, brothers and sisters, when I came to you, I did not come with eloquence or human wisdom, as I proclaimed to you the testimony about God. For I resolved to know nothing while I was with you, except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I came to you in weakness, with great fear and trembling. There is no question here that this teaching is not attractive. A crucified leader, hanging limp and lifeless on a Roman cross. Follow him. And Paul's point is that even as he called the Corinthians to do just that, he didn't present his argument with flashy advertising or with an attractive sales pitch. You've got to remember that that first century Corinth was a proud, cosmopolitan Roman city. It's full of people trying to get on in life, trying to make a name for themselves, trying to get a break. Walk down a street in Roman Corinth and, and you'd be bombarded with offers. The latest wares from distant lands brought by the traders to the bustling port. Or the latest athletic regime dreamt up by those preparing for Corinth's famous Isthmian Games second only to the Olympics. And you'd certainly be offered sex. Lots of it. Ancient Corinth was famous, or or perhaps infamous, for having made much of sex, for turning it into a religion, a way of life. And into that hustle and bustle, into the, the competing marketplace of ideas and lifestyles, into all of that came the Apostle Paul. And what did he have to offer? A crucified carpenter from a backwater of the Roman Empire who'd fallen foul of the authorities, who'd upset both the Roman and Jewish rulers, who'd been killed as a traitor and blasphemer, whose remaining followers were still viewed with suspicion and derision by those in power across the empire. And what of Paul himself? the the spokesman for this new movement, well, he, he positively embraced weakness. 
He didn't offer signs. He didn't put on a show. He didn't promise strength and power, a a revolutionary uprising. He didn't polish and hone his rhetorical flourishes in order to, to whip up his hearers into a frenzy. No. He knew nothing while he was with them except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Paul came in weakness with great fear and trembling. It's not very attractive, is it? Much like a a yellow-brown waxy lump on a beach, I reckon most people just walked past. I reckon most of us would have. And, And we need to acknowledge that. This message wasn't only weak and unattractive then, it still is today. Our culture, the the world around us, well, well, it doesn't value weak. It doesn't value poor. It doesn't value quiet and unassuming. We're so used to hearing it, especially at church, that I think we miss it. But we have to recognize that a naked, bloody, beaten, bruised, convicted criminal gasping for breath as he dies a brutal death. That's not a good look. It's not attractive to people today. People want to see strength and leadership, decisiveness and popularity. People who who value success and and influence, beauty and comfort. And in an age of, of vibrant, captivating, immersive, surround sound cinematic experience, or at least an amusing, eye catching TikTok. Is this really the best best way we can deliver the message? A book, an old book at that. It's not even a a trendy TED talk to a packed out auditorium. Look, I, I know we're bigger than a lot of Sunday morning gatherings, but it's still just me or John or Colin talking to a few hundred people. And let's be honest, Most people in Nottingham are not in church today. They're busy doing other things. Now, friends, the reality is that that today, just as in first century Corinth, the message of Christianity is unattractive and unappealing. Maybe even actively repellent. Like a stinky lump of washed up sea junk. Although, of course, you probably guessed by now that what Jumrus Tiapchot had in his shed wasn't just a lump of junk. Eventually, it was inspected by some local officials and they confirmed that it was, in fact, a substance called ambergris. It comes from sperm whales. We're not entirely sure how they excrete it. It's either a form of vomit or of feces. Still not very attractive. But to those in the know, this stuff is incredibly valuable. It's been used for for centuries to fix the scent of perfumes, to make them last longer. And it is incredibly rare. It can float around at sea for decades before it finally washes ashore. To the right people, to those who understand what it is and what it can do, that stinky lump of washed up sea junk is more precious than gold. That particular lump was worth $250,000. The message of Christianity may sound foolish, says Paul. The messenger may well be weak. It could be that this looks like a worthless lump of sea junk. But make sure you've seen it for what it really is. Verse 4. My message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power so that your faith might not rest on human wisdom, 
but on God's power. You see, underneath its unattractive exterior, behind its unimpressive human agents, there lies in the gospel of Jesus Christ something of immense power, of immeasurable wisdom. Don't dismiss this message, Paul says, until you're sure you've seen its true value. Verse 6, we do, however, speak a message of wisdom among the mature, but not the wisdom of this age or of the rulers of this age who are coming to nothing. No, we declare God's wisdom, a mystery that has been hidden and that God destined for our glory before time began. This message, says Paul, this crucified king, this is the wisdom of God. It's not the same as as the wisdom of the world. It doesn't follow their rules. Indeed, it's been hidden. Hidden in the sense that it has not yet been revealed. But now, well, well, now it's time. Time for God's great wisdom, his great power, to be seen for what it is. But even then, as as the great mystery of the ages is unveiled, well, even then, many will not see its beauty. Verse 8. None of the rulers of this age understood it, for if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. However, as it is written, what no eye has seen, what no ear has heard, and what no human mind has conceived, the things God has prepared for those who love him. I wonder if you've ever heard anybody say that they'd believe in God if only he'd show himself to them. If only God would would make himself visible and, and do something here that would show who he is, that would demonstrate his power and his authority. Well, you know what? In Jesus of Nazareth, that is exactly what he did. I have never seen God. But if I'd have been alive at the right time, in the right part of the Middle East, well, well, then I would have. My friends, here's the thing. There were hundreds, probably thousands of people who were there and who did see Jesus who witnessed his miracles, who heard his teaching, who saw his power and his authority, and yet didn't see who he was, didn't bow the knee to their God, didn't put their trust in God's chosen Messiah. That's Paul's point in verse 8. Some of the finest religious minds of his time Some of the most powerful political and military leaders, they had met with Jesus. They'd seen his works, heard his words. They'd even had private audiences with him and and cross-examined him. And yet they never knew what they were looking at. They never knew who they were dealing with. They chose instead in their ignorance to crucify the Lord of glory. There could be no clearer evidence that that what the Lord has done in his son Jesus Christ is the wisdom of God and not of humankind. You and, and I, we, any of us, we would not have done it this way. We could not even conceive of how one might win victory through defeat. Might secure freedom through submission. Might bring life through death. And yet that is precisely the wisdom and the power of the cross of Jesus Christ. You know those words quoted in in verse 9 come from a passage of Isaiah where the people of God are asking for the Lord to step in, to act, to save his people, pleading with the Lord of glory to come down. The great tragedy is that when he did, in the person of Jesus Christ, so many missed it. 
They didn't see it. They couldn't see it. That was true on the day that Christ died. It was true in first century Corinth, and it is still true today. Why? Because verse 10, these are the things God has revealed to us by his Spirit. The Spirit searches all things, even the deep things of God. This wisdom of God is made known by the Spirit of God. We don't arrive at the gospel by adopting a particular philosophy or or by practicing a particular ritual. We can't simply apply our human minds to it until we reason it out. This is the wisdom of God. And so only God himself can make it known. Verse 11, for who knows a person's thoughts except their own spirit within them? In the same way, no one knows the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. What we have received is not the Spirit of this world, but the Spirit who is from God, so that we may understand what God has freely given us. If you're a Christian here today, I wonder, have you ever asked the question, why? Why are you a Christian? Why have you responded to the gospel of Jesus Christ by giving your life to him, by committing to to following him? And, you know, I'm sure every one of us who's a believer today can, can name people who were influential in bringing us to faith. Someone who introduced us to Jesus, someone who patiently listened to and, and tried to answer our questions, someone who encouraged us to respond in repentance and faith. We praise God for those people. But friends, why? Why did you respond like that? Why have you seen something beautiful, something valuable in the cross of Christ when so many see only foolishness and weakness? Maybe, you, maybe you've just thought a little harder, reasoned a little better. Maybe you're just more spiritually sensitive, more insightful. Well, of course, it's none of those. That's not the gospel. No, these are the things God has revealed to us by his Spirit. Our very faith in Jesus Christ is itself a gift of God. He has, by his Spirit, softened hard hearts, unstopped deaf ears, opened blind eyes, that we might see and hear, that we might understand the wisdom of God. You know, there are are much more famous passages coming up in this letter that speak of the work of the Holy Spirit amongst his people. But this, surely, is the most miraculous work of the Spirit. To take dead, rebellious people, people who by nature can see only foolishness and weakness in the cross, to take such people and to open their eyes that they might see the true beauty and boundless value of our dear Saviour's sacrifice. To take such people and bring them to life. And let us be quite clear here. This is, this is no vague spirituality. It's no ethereal force of nature. No, this is the specific personal spirit of the God of the Bible. Eleven times in this chapter, he is named. There can be no doubt that it is his work to make the wisdom of God, hidden for so long, revealed in Jesus Christ, to make the wisdom of God known to a people in need of a saviour. It is only the Spirit of God who can open our eyes, that we might look to the cross and see not a pathetic, defeated, 
worthless upstart who was crushed by the might of the Roman Empire, but rather the glorious, exalted Son of God, lifted up as he secured by his wounds the ultimate victory over sin, death, and the devil, bringing life to billions who would put their trust in him. If you're a believer here today, then give thanks to the Spirit of God for his work in revealing to you the wisdom of God. And more than that, give thanks that you not only have the understanding of the Spirit, but that you have the Spirit himself living within you. That's what we read in verse 12. And and it means that as we come to the scriptures, as as spirit indwelt believers, something remarkable is happening. To those who are in Christ, this is not just a book. It is the spirit given, spirit revealed word of God for the people of God. God's gracious communication to us, his people made known to us by the work of his spirit as we come to these his words. Andrew Wilson summarizes it wonderfully. He says, as believers, we read the scriptures which the spirit inspired in the midst of the church whom the spirit has filled in search of the Christ whom the spirit reveals. And that has profound implications for us as we seek to share this message with those around us. Verse 13, this is what we speak, not in words taught us by human wisdom, but in words taught by the Spirit, explaining spiritual realities with Spirit-taught words. A person without the Spirit does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God, but considers them foolishness and cannot understand them because they are discerned only through the Spirit. The person with the Spirit makes judgments about all things, but such a person is not subject to merely human judgments. For who has known the mind of the Lord so as to instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. The wisdom of God is made known by the Spirit of God to the people of God. It is only as the Spirit does his work of regeneration that any of us may hear and respond to the call of the gospel. It should not surprise us that we may know friends and family, colleagues and neighbours, whom we are certain have been present when the good news of Jesus Christ has been proclaimed. Maybe you took them to an evangelistic event. Maybe we ourselves shared the gospel with them. And yet they have not responded. They have not heard. They have not put their faith in Christ. Explaining spiritual reality, says Wilson, with with spirit-taught words will mean you get a lot of blank faces from unspiritual people. They have no idea what you are on about. And that ought to lead us to two things. First, the importance of prayer. As we seek to make Christ known to those around us, as we look to make disciples in Nottingham, in in all nations and in the next generation, we may be certain that we will see no success at all unless the spirit of the living God is at work. We cannot simply persuade people into salvation with the quality of our arguments or or with the force of our passion for Christ. Becoming convinced of the truth of the gospel is a profoundly spiritual event. The person without the spirit does not accept the things that come from the spirit of God but considers them foolishness and cannot understand them because they are discerned only 
through the Spirit. As we share Christ with those around us, we must ask the Spirit to be at work. But secondly, and importantly, we may also be confident that he does work. That he does soften hearts. He does open eyes. After all, if you're a Christian, well, well, then that's what's happened to you. You didn't earn it. You didn't deserve it. You were given your salvation. You were given your faith by the work of the Holy Spirit revealing the wisdom of God in the cross of Christ to you, a child of God. And so we may share the good news of Christ, the beauty of the cross, with great joy and confidence. Not surprised if people don't get it, but also expectant. Expectant that some people will get it. Not because we're especially eloquent, nor because we package it in any particularly attractive way, but rather because the Spirit of the living God is at work to make known the wisdom of God to the people of God. And the astonishing, beautiful truth is that once he has done that, he continues to work. He continues to work in us, making us day by day more and more like the crucified, risen, and ascended Lord who has made us his own. The Spirit gives us the mind of Christ that we might share his passions, his priorities, his pursuits. That we might grasp afresh each moment the glorious, beautiful, wonderful treasure that is ours. In Jesus Christ. That we might give our very lives to know him. To have him. You know, I wonder how Jumrus Tiachot thought of that lump of ambergris once he knew what it was. Once he appreciated what he'd got in his possession. I bet he cradled it in his hands, admiring the strange waxy surface, enjoying the musky odor. And you know what? I'll, I'll bet he took it out of his shed. And he spent every waking moment thinking how he could hold on to this precious possession, keep this thing of, of magnificent value, To those around, it may have continued to be merely another bit of sea junk. But to those who knew, to those who perceived, oh, it had become the most exquisite prize. Brothers and sisters, let's be honest. The world may think as bonkers for giving our lives to Christ. They may question why we'd, why we'd give up our Sunday to gather at church. Why we'd give up our money to support the work of his people. Why we'd give up status or career or popularity or comfort for the sake of some ancient preacher who died a criminal's death. But for those of us who know, for those to whom the Spirit of God has revealed the wisdom of God, oh, this Jesus Christ is the most exquisite prize. Let us hold tight to him. Let us continue to call others to him, trusting that the wisdom of God will be made known by the Spirit of God to the people of God for the glory of Christ and for the eternal joy of all who put their trust in him.